Hello and welcome back to Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion. This week we look at the future of data storage in space as we talk with Ohad Harley, CEO of Lightloop. But first, we examine the case of the missing supernova, an exploding star that should have been seen on Earth three centuries ago and wasn't. Next, we take a look at the Chinese Space Station Telescope, a new set of eyes readying to explore the universe. Then, we look in on the first test flights of Ingenuity, the first helicopter ever to fly on another world. Finally, we examine the first ever production of oxygen on the Martian surface, bringing us one step closer to living on Mars. The Nebula Cassiopeia A is a well-studied supernova remnant about 11,000 light years from Earth. This gaseous cloud was created in a supernova explosion which should have been seen from Earth more than 300 years ago. However, no records from that time clearly record the presence of a new star in the sky. New examination of that nebula seen in eight years of data from NASA's Chandra X-ray Telescope uh, suggests that subatomic particles called neutrinos may have affected the nature of this particular eruption. Join us starting May 11th when we're going to talk with astrophysicist Dr. Jack Hughes of Rutgers University discussing this intriguing study. The Chinese Space Station Telescope, scheduled for launch in 2024, will be China's first major space telescope. Unlike other instruments like Hubble, the CSST will orbit Earth alongside China's upcoming space station. The CSST will be about as large as the Hubble Space Telescope, but will see around 300 times as much sky in every image. Astronomers there will use this new orbiting observatory to answer questions about dark matter and dark energy, as well as search for icy bodies at the edge of our family of planets, as well as asteroids that might impact Earth. Ingenuity, the first helicopter ever designed to fly on another world, took its first test flights on the surface of the red planet. This flight control confirming that we have EVRs from Ingenuity. Ingenuity is reporting having performed spin-up, takeoff, climb, hover, descent, landing, touchdown, and spin down. And al altimeter data confirm that Ingenuity has performed its first flight, the first flight of a powered aircraft on another planet. Over the next month, the drone-like craft will undertake increasingly more challenging flights, testing techniques, learning how to fly helicopters on other worlds. If tests continue to prove successful, other bodies with atmospheres, such as Saturn's largest moon, Titan, might be explored by similar helicopter-like robotic explorers. On April 20th, the MOXIE experiment on board the Perseverance rover manufactured breathable oxygen from the atmosphere of Mars for the first time. This toaster-sized experiment 
produced about five grams of the gas, which is enough for a human being to breathe for around 10 minutes. Converters for future human colonies on the red planet, however, would need to be about a hundred times larger than Moxie. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. Next up, we welcome Ohad Harley, CEO of Lightloop, to the show, discussing new technologies for storing data in space. This week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, we're happy to talk with o Ohad Harlib. He is the CEO of Lightloop, a company which is developing a fascinating, intriguing new way to store data in space. Welcome to the show, Ohad. Thank you so much for having me and for the interest. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about what is Lightloop and how does it work? Absolutely. So uh, thank you again. Um, we at Lightloop have uh, developed literally a brand new way of storing data. And that brand new way is a brand new medium. And that medium is light. That's where the name comes from. So we can store data for very long periods of time on photons, on light. And it could be that we are storing it between satellites, which which is our primary focus. And that's all I believe, I hope we can talk about uh, today because that's our primary focus and interest. But we can also do it on a terrestrial application. But in essence, it's always the same. If we choose a satellite application, it's having data for, from go from satellite A to B to C to D back to A, just float around all the time. And that is a storage mechanism between satellites, not on them or on anything. Oh, okay, so why store data in space? Why not keep it in large servers or, you know, terrestrial data centers or a whole mess of post-it notes? <laughs> so I can't reply about, about post-it notes or, or, or wall carvings yet, but we look at all the other words you, you mentioned. If it doesn't matter if you're calling it a server farm, a server, a hard disk, a flash drive, a um, data center, a cloud provider, at the end of the day, it's bits on a hard drive. Mm -hmm. And that's the same way that we've been storing data since the 60s and 70s and 80s. We just keep on changing the name and improving evolutionary the technology. The key issue is we're doing that and continue to do that. And again, we will be continuing to do that as humanity. But still, the key issue that we're facing with that technology is, first of all, we are being hacked. We are being hacked all the time. One of my favorite quotes is by one of the former heads of the NSA who said the world is divided into two kinds of people, people who have been hacked and know about it, and people who have been hacked and don't know about it. <laughs> um, so first problem is adding more layers of cybersecurity. Second problem is uh, the amount of energy, electricity, and other resources that data storage takes um, between CPUs and storage data centers in the world use between three to four percent of the world's data of the world's energy or let's put it in perspective google uses more power than the uk wow and so that's two main problems another two main problems is we're just creating so much data we need more and more storage we're not building storage fast enough and we can't build storage fast enough because we're also expediting the rate at which we are creating all this data. And last but not least is every single data center. It's a physical site. It's not movable. It takes a very long time to build. 
and there's a certain law and jurisdiction that will apply to it that we may or may not want our um, data to be subject to said law or jurisdiction. We may want our law or jurisdiction to apply to it, not where the data is stored. We believe that storing data in motion, depending on the medium or where we're doing it, can, stay, can solve three or four of these issues. If we stay on terrestrial base, we can say we can improve three of those elements. If we go to space, we can improve on all four and many more. Wow. So, you know, you mentioned on your website that it's not impossible to hack communication between satellites, but mm -hmm. it hasn't been done yet because there's a whole new, you know, order of magnitude of difficulty. But how does the security of a space-based data system compare to traditional systems? So, uh Experiments about hacking has been done on satellites. And also, um, just because uh, we don't know that it's been hacked doesn't mean that it hasn't been hacked. So I'm assuming it is being hacked all the time. Um, and now the question is, how do we add extra layers that even if you are physically being hacked or actually being hacked, it doesn't quote unquote matter too much because it matters, but to minimize the impact. And I'll explain what I mean. So. For example, we at Lightloop take each and every packet, sorry, each and every file, break it up into tens of thousands of packets and throw them randomly in the loop. Which means if you've hacked into a certain stream, which we'll talk about how difficult that will be in a second, but if you do that, you get a packet. You get two packets, you get a couple of packets, but they're from completely different files. You don't get a file. So, in order to get the full file, you need to download exabytes of data, i.e. the entire data center plus to get a file, which is hard. Second thing is physical hacking. It is a real thing. People do physically hack into data centers. There's a reason it's a multi, multi-billion dollar business of alarms, guards, locks, because people do lock, physically break into data centers and steal data. We've all seen Mission Impossible and others, <laughs> but it's a lot easier than that. Um, it's a lot harder to physically go into space and hack data that's no, no longer you and I. Well, maybe tomorrow, but not today. <laughs> uh, so, that's the second, so that's the second layer. Third layer is, uh, sorry, uh, still in the second layer, if someone approaches your data center, if it's an adversary or someone approaches you and you see that, doesn't matter if it's an adversary, a physical hacker, or a force majeure, you won't be able to physically move your data center. However, if your data center is beams, you shut down a satellite, you shut down that node, the adversary is arrived to a no place and you just flick it back on once you can, once he's passed. Um, third layer is quantum encryption. Quantum encryption is here. We can add an extra layer of quantum encryption, which means that the second that someone touches the beam, the beam is gone. So ignore everything I said before, it's gone. And you can't touch anything. And we can, of course, reconstruct everything and your data is not lost, but the hackers got to somewhere that won't help him. And they can only do that on moving photons, which we do. And last but not least, if you don't trust the terrestrial network you're in, because you're in a country that you don't trust who is listening in, quote unquote, you can uplink directly. To, the spa to space using VSAT or terminals or whatever, get directly to the data center without touching the most vulnerable part of the path, which is a third party or a terrestrial network that you don't know who's quote unquote eavesdropping. Hmm. And so, you know, as we expand out into space, um, you know, the Chinese and Russians recently agreed to build an international uh, lunar base on the moon. Mm -hmm. uh, NASA and SpaceX are both aiming for the moon and Mars. Um, right. And so at that point, you know, we're going to have, you know, you think you have a lot of data now. There's going to be all <laughs> kinds of data out there when these yep. people and colonists are um, depending on information. So how can this system help us with the moving off of the face of our planet. 
So one, definitely. It helps us with a couple of things. And if I want to choose the two primary ways it will help us is we need, if we are going to be a solar system based society, then we will need to make sure that not all our eggs are in one basket. It's not very efficient, especially when we talk about communication and storage, which time and latency are very, very critical. One of the things we love about Lightloop is that when I looked at space and I came from the business side of the space, so I'm not a scientist, but I just fell in love with the concept of what you can do with space. And just to make clear what that means, it means that from my point of view, space is there, yes, for exploration, for science, um, and that's the primary goal, I think. But the secondary goal, when you look at it for, for business, then it can fulfill a lot of our needs as individuals, as corporation, and as humanity in a lot more efficient way than we can do it terrestrial. If you take communication, you can communicate across the world without space. But once we've been able to do it through space with telecom, with telecom satellites, it's so much easier. So let's utilize space. Having said that, if we want to go and improve the space economy, one of the biggest problems we have with space is gravity. Gravity means that everything we want to take up there is just very expensive. We are extremely lucky with the fact that our medium that we store on is actually photons, which are massless. Right. So we're taking a medium. That, now, once that medium is massless, it means you can all create these constellations around the relevant, let's call it celestial body, Earth, Moon, Mars. But you can also take with you the quote unquote the terrestrial versions of Light Loop, just deploy them in on the Moon or Mars. So we strongly believe that we are going as humanity beyond this planet. We strongly believe that everything we do as humanity is data driven, especially in space exploration. Mm. And therefore we have a lot of solutions because we're focusing on assisting that very important initiative. Hmm. And when you talk about space, you're going to need to, your system is going to work off of a net constellation of satellites. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that system? How are you developing it? How will it be launched? Are you, how are you getting it up in, up in space? So we we're, we are extremely lucky. We're extremely lucky because we're working on the cutting edge of technology of science, but we're even more uh, luckier, if that is a word, because we're developing the science ourselves. So we're very lucky that we don't need to do, rely on anyone else. We've got the expertise and the you know and the know-how, and we've, we've done all the patents uh, to be able to sustain this. Which means we're we're literally crawling, walking, running. We did all the terrestrial proof of concept including light drives, which is a nice cool word, word uh, used for usually for movement, but we're using light drives for storage, um, including a lot of other things. Now, after our final, uh, oh, sorry, our last round, we are uh, starting to build a proof of concept of six satellites, which um, we are in the midst of issuing the uh, RFP for the manufacturers to provide the standard buses, but all the payload, all the magic is upper pattern magic that we're building. Once that's up and we play with it, that should be up in three years time, uh, i.e. 2023, 2024. Once that is up, we play with it. The next constellation, which is going to be a very large constellation, starts with uh, 60 satellites times two. Um, that will again, the uh, satellite will be built for us um, with upper proprietary payloads. Hmm. These are going to be relatively small satellites, uh, but not uh, nano satellites. So you're going up aboard your own dedicated crafts, or mm -hmm. okay? So are you developing so, your so, own? Yes. Go ahead. You developing your own launch systems, or going with SpaceX or another private industry? Or so we're not going to develop anything that we don't need to. So if there's a really good cart out there, you won't go and invent it or really good wheel. Um, there are great launchers and we will take out uh, one of the current launchers because we don't have any dedicated need, which is different than quote, anyone else for launch services. Uh, there are great 
uh, bus manufacturers who can manufacture the basic quote unquote uh, satellites out there, which are great, which you can have a lot of flexibility and versatility to put in your payload. We cannot use a lot of the, for example, laser systems or other systems that are needed because they're very, very dedicated and unique and those we will build and develop ourselves. But whatever we can get, which is as much as you can say space travel is standard, but as much as we can get that standardized, we won't in reinvent the standard. Mm -hmm. So what are your biggest challenges going forward at this point? Well, um, if we would have been speaking, you know, two, three years ago, um, I would have said physics. Because no matter how much money you've got in the world, you can't change physics. You cannot change the laws some... of physics, Captain. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And we all know that, and we all grew up on that. Um, but that, luckily enough for us, we've been able to overcome the physics. And now we're at the engineering phase. Um, but surprisingly enough, the biggest challenge, I think, is bringing the right people. Because an idea and an execution is just as good as the people that are working on it. And we've been extremely lucky to be able to grow from 10 people to 28 people in three months or four months time. But I think a lot more than that is that we were extremely lucky that we were able to bring amazing people on board. Um, and the biggest challenge is how do we continue to bring this amazing talent, keep our very unique DNA of collaboration and have fun, which is what we're all about and what tackling these and meet the deadlines, which we believe we can. So yes, it's engineering, it's not physics anymore, but maybe it's about talent and not engineering, which could could not be the same thing. That's great. <clears throat> Thanks so much for being on this show, Ohad. It was, it was a whole lot of fun talking with you. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. And that was Ohad Haliv, CEO of Lightloop. Make sure to tune in next week when we'll be joined by Dr. Stella Kafka, CEO and Executive Director of the American Association of Variable Star Observers. We're going to talk about amateur astronomy, the nature of the cosmos, and, oh yes, variable stars. So make sure to tune in then. And join us each week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion as we bring space and astronomy news together with groundbreaking scientists directly to listeners and viewers around the globe. Subscribers to our VIP newsletter see every episode of this show a day before the general public. Now, we depend on support from viewers just like you. For ways to help support this program, including VIP subscriptions, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net forward slash support. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and keep your wonder alive. If you enjoyed this episode of Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, please download and share the episode on YouTube, Facebook video, or on any major podcast provider. For more details on space and astronomy news, you know you want the deets, please visit thecosmiccompanion.com or thecosmiccompanion.net